Egyptian just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. I'm hoping you are hearing this. <laughs> As we record, I have broken the websites. Hopefully by the time you hear this, everything will have been repaired and everything will continue on as normal. If anyone tried to get to the websites or download episodes prior to this and couldn't, sorry. But please go back and try again. <laughs> We're not tacking webmaster onto your title. <laughs> <laughs> nope, you definitely should not. Uh, Tom, how you doing? Not too bad. It's been a really long week in the past day or so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, this is definitely one of these, oh, God, what a week. Uh, it's Monday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally having that myself. So we apologize in advance if we come off a little... Long in the tooth. <laughs> yeah, a little less energetic than yep. maybe sometimes. Yeah, yeah, we will, we will, we will do our best. Uh, but we're still funny. Laugh. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> if I insert the laugh track. Ah. I'm not sure exactly when it will come out. I think it'll be about the same time as this episode drops, or soon thereafter. I'll be guesting on uh, former co-host Matt's new podcast, "Good Movie, Bad Movie." Yeah. We're going to be talking about Shin Godzilla. Still haven't seen that. Oh, really? I really haven't. Yeah, no, I, I like it, it, it. Not even sure where I would watch it. Yeah, I don't think it's streaming anywhere. Yeah, that, that, that's part of the problem. And I, I haven't gone out of my way to get a hard copy or anything. Right. Okay, well, anyway... It should be a fun conversation over there. They have a, a, a lot of fun. I said new podcast, but they've been around for almost a year now, I, mm -hmm. I imagine, I think. so. But uh, hopefully you'll all go and check them out and check out that episode as well. I know what we're going to be doing. I'm actually going to guest on two episodes. Oh, yeah. But I don't want to say what the second episode is in case it... A surprise. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to ruin any any potential surprises if anyone else listens or anything. So let the man put out his own press ahead of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hey, did you watch the uh, newest Grand Tour? It, I, you know, we should have talked about that beforehand. No, I have actually really. Not. You were you were saying you were so excited for that coming around, I, and you you. I am, but what it is is I'm savoring because I am still making my way through all of the old Grand Tour, and I just watched the French episode, um, so I'm closing in on it. I think I'm only about two or three episodes away from the brand new, so. All right. Um, fair enough. Fair enough. I thought for sure you'd uh, uh, yeah, I, squeeze that in. I, I I had it in my head that I was going to queue it up, and I'm like, but I've only got a few more between, so I could just kind of watch the progression, and, and then I get to savor it a little longer. But um, without spoiling anything for me, how was it? I'm actually going to let you watch it. Okay. I'm not going to say anything. Whether we talk about it on the show or not in the future, you know, it doesn't matter. I... I want you to watch it without hearing my thoughts okay all right all well right. then that is to come soon <laughs> yes uh have you been able to watch anything else i've not watched a great deal not 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 of anything of any significance no i've been uh i've been unfortunately delving into the political too much so i've been uh i've been very much enjoyed the return of uh John Stewart, even though he, they and they they really love making fun of the fact he's only on one night night each <laughs> week. So it it was fun, particularly during the first episode to his return, as they all ragged on him for the fact that he's only going to be on one episode a week. So, but he hasn't lost a step. It's a lot of fun to watch him, and I love that everyone seems to forget how John works. Because 
He's not. Uh, people are claiming uh, that he's like he he's too much trying to be on both sides of the fence at the same time, and I don't think that's really his stance. What I believe his stance is is that there is stuff to make fun of on both sides of the fence, no matter what. So. No, absolutely. No, that's one of the things I always kind of liked about him. Obviously, he leans to one side of the political spectrum sure. more than the others, but if his side, if you want to call it that, does something or says something stupid, he'll be one of the first ones to jump on it. Oh, yeah. And no. all over it. <laughs> no, like right out of the gate on the first episode, he he hit hard on the fact that Biden's old. Mm, well, yeah. That that's not that's not like an opinion or anything. He is. The man's 81. <laughs> so yeah, at this point, you should be probably retired from just about anything that you were doing, because it's not usually the kind of age that you expect to have the most important job in the world right. being head by. So it's a legitimate critique, but yeah, the, the liberal side came out and they were really mad and like, aren't you one of us? Kind of, and they're like, like, dude, I might have liberal leanings, but this is fact. That's a real right. thing. <laughs> yeah. He's an old man. He's an old man. <laughs> he, he'll admit, he, he, even because uh, actually Biden was even on one of the talk shows uh, just this past week, and he makes fun of his age right there with everybody else. So, I mean, it, he's aware that it's a reality. So, mm. yeah, I just thought it was funny that it, it, he's not on the show but five minutes and people are attacking him from all sides. But he... he, he he just trods along, and he's funny doing it. Good, good. Yep. Oh, I know what I watched. I don't think... I think it's been since the last time we, we, we recorded it. I don't think I talked about it last time. I finally watched uh, Blue Beetle. Did I talk about that last episode? No, you didn't. And uh, actually, not bad timing. Uh, I only just recently watched Blue Beetle. <laughs> My comment on it when I, I posted that I watched it is that if you've never seen any other superhero film yeah this is a great one to watch because it won't feel like every other superhero film you've seen <laughs> I, I suppose but with my familiarity with the characters and, and all i just found it like I didn't know what it was trying to be it was stupid goofy most of the time yeah. But then kind of tried to be serious about what it was trying to do, too. So I, I I felt like it just missed all the way around. No, I, I felt a lot of the same way. It it felt like, if you want to cross universes, it felt like it, 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 this is Spider-Man. Kind of, yeah. Or uh, with... And since he's in that suit, it's got lots of Iron Man quality to it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, he, he's got an alien essentially possessing him too, and uh, th that you could dig into any sort of sci-fi for st stuff like that. It, I just, I, I wanted to be entertained, and I just kind of wasn't. And then, then also knowing that this was one of the last outings for this version of DC, anyway. The fact that they even bothered to set up uh, anything related to the original Blue Beetle, Ted Cord, mm -hmm. and you are never going to get anything <laughs> on that. So it, it just kind of rung hollow watching the thing. Yeah. No, nah, it wasn't. Yeah, it just. It, it wasn't that pretty. it was bad. It just wasn't a good. It just wasn't good. You're right. It, it Tonally, it was all over the map. Mm. Uh they could have done a lot more with it, and I suppose maybe if you want to keep within the universe, this isn't all that different than Shazam, the first Shazam film. Yeah, and I still haven't seen the second one. I watched it. Yeah. And I'll be damned if I can tell you anything that happened in it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the general consensus, consensus from what I understand. Yeah, I have, I have vague recollections of it. I, I could describe a couple scenes, but as far as what the plot was, I got nothing. <laughs> well, 
Well, good. Uh, a solid review for me to go and follow <laughs> up and watch that one. I, I, I tell you what I did watch. I actually saw it in the theater just as it's now making it onto Max since we're in the superhero zone. It was the, the second Aquaman movie. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, up on Max, so it's, okay. it, it's available for you now. But uh, um, I found that one especially having a, a, a close friend that is a big Aquaman fan, but he's a super friends Aquaman fan. Oh, right. So this does not work for him. So I get a little kid. It's like me egging you on about the Matthew Broderick Godzilla movie. <laughs> it, it sits the same way for him. He's like, this is not Aquaman. So I'm thoroughly amused just at the fact that it's irritating him as much as it does but i actually kind of enjoyed the second outing as well it, oh good yeah no. i i don't remember i don't remember having any strong opinion one way or the other about the first film that's another one that just i watched it yeah it was fine oh really i actually i i, I actually find i'm very entertained by the first one i i'll revisit that one from time to time even because it it may be that i just don't recall because it has been a while since yeah. that first one came out well, you also watch a lot of movies <laughs> I, yeah i might do myself a disservice by watching as much as i do my my inner movie universe in my head is a strange strange and fevered dream sort of place <laughs> yeah and, and, well yeah and, and let's face it our brains aren't getting any younger so <laughs> <laughs> there's only so much room for so much stuff in there yeah yeah i think i might be forcing some things out when you start calling your wife by a, another name entirely that's when you know you're gonna have to pull back a little bit <laughs> <laughs> Honest, honey, I don't have a mistress. I just have too many movie characters in my head. <laughs> yeah, no, other than that, I've been going back and watching, as I often do when I can't think of really anything else to watch, is pull up some old mystery science theater. Oh, uh, I, I know what I, I have been following up, and that's always fun, but uh, hey, uh, I've been into crime stuff, and so I finished uh, the, this recent version of True Detective on Max as well, and I found that one amazing. Good. Yeah. No, I've not looked. I've not watched any of that. No, the whole take one setting it in, in a very northern fictitious uh, town in Alaska brings a very kind of creepy element to the whole thing, especially since the the whole story is supposed to take place um, in, well, the the subtitle for the, uh, for this season was Night Country, and, okay. and that's a direct reference to when um, that area goes into darkness because the sun has gone away. <laughs> So, okay. So this is when day, night, doesn't matter. It's all dark all the time. <laughs> so uh, that adds an extra element to it. But no, the acting, the, the, the story, it was all on point. It was amazing to watch. So highly recommend. All right, cool. Well, I think if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and take a break. Uh, we'll play a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we're going to take a look at a very different film in this series so far. Mm -hmm. 1966's Fahrenheit 451. The best of the best and the worst of the worst the one where all the characters curse. Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, IMDb, and Letterbox all want to stick a simple rating on what we watch. But where's the nuance in that? A popular movie doesn't always age well, and who cares if the critics didn't like it? We here at Good Movie, Bad Movie believe every film has an audience. So join us for the good, the bad, and the so bad it's good, such as The Godfather. Back to the Future. Gili. Jaws. Young Frankenstein. Manos, the hands of fate. 
Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And Plan 9 from Outer Space. New episodes every other Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Instagram at GoodMovieBadMoviePod or write to us at GoodMovieBadMoviePod at gmail.com. Or join us on our Discord server by searching Good Movie, Bad Movie. The cream of the crop and the box office flops. Fahrenheit 451. Ray Bradbury, America's leading science fiction novelist, wrote it. Julie Christie, Academy Award-winning actress of Darling and Dr. Zhivago, and Oscar Werner, winner of the New York Critics' Best Actor Award, star in it. We shall see each other again? Yeah, we shan't. Why pretend we shall? Directed by internationally famous French director Francois Truffaut. And now, a rare privilege, candid scenes taken during the shooting of this exciting and suspenseful story of the world of tomorrow. Fahrenheit 451. Is there an idle moment between scenes? Press photographers are quick to take advantage. For the public, of course, the big news in Fahrenheit 451 is Julie Christie, an actress with that most precious commodity the ability to create, project, and kindle a mood in the audience. Her range, so strikingly demonstrated in Darling and now in Fahrenheit 451, is almost unbelievable. Pensive, cheerful, somber, artful, gay, relaxed, taut, bewildered, determined, loving. Nuances, subtleties, delicate shadings that are a director's dream and for viewers a delight. In this film, Julie plays a dual role, portraying both the wife and mistress of Oscar Werner. Here she is as the wife. I brought you a present to celebrate your... Oh, I forget what. Never mind. Do you like it? Isn't it lovely? Do you like it? Yes, I do. Very much. Isn't it smart? It's the very latest thing. Can I throw your old one away? All right. As the mistress, Julie Christie makes her greatest impact. Warm, generous, daring, she fires the imagination of her lover and leads him into the sort of adventure that makes Fahrenheit 451 unusual and exciting motion picture entertainment. Fahrenheit 451 is a drama directed by Francois Truffaut and stars Julie Christie, Oscar uh, Werner, and Cyril Cusack. It is based on the 1953 novel of the same name by Ray Bradbury. Film takes place in a post-2020. The society is ruled by an oppressive government that controls the people with pills and television. To prevent anyone from thinking beyond the government's strict ideals, all literature is banned. Firemen are now responsible for burning anything considered contraband. Guy Montag is rising quickly through the ranks of his local fire department. A promotion seems certain. But after watching his television-obsessed wife become an intellectual vegetable and seeing a woman sacrifice herself for a library of books, he begins to question and wonder what draws people to these illegal objects. This was Truffaut's first color film and his only non-French-speaking film, and it was Universal Pictures' first European production. It was filmed at Pinewood Studios in England, with the exterior shot in South London and Berkshire, and the suspended monorail scene in the film was filmed at a test track near, near Orleans, France. And then unfortunately, I, I read that it was demolished soon after filming. Oh. Yeah, it's kind of like if I was ever in that part of the country, it's kind of like, oh, I want to go see the Fahrenheit 451 train. Can't, can't do that. I know. No, that thing was amazing and about the only thing that was very, in any way, really futuristic. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Almost. Uh, Apparently, in a 2007 interview, Ray Bradbury uh, said that people misinterpreted his book and that Fahrenheit 451 uh, wasn't so much about censorship, but it was really a statement on how mass media like television marginalizes the reading of literature. Hmm. Fahrenheit 451 is not, he says firmly, a story about government censorship, wrote the Los Angeles Weekly's Amy E. Boyle Johnson in 2007. Nor was it a response to Senator Joseph McCarthy, whose investigations had already instilled fear and stifled the creativity of thousands. 
Rather, he meant his 1953 novel as a story about how television destroys interest in reading literature. It's about, he puts it above, people being turned into morons by TV. Johnson quotes Bradbury describing television as a medium that gives you the dates of Napoleon, but not who he was, spreading factoids instead of knowledge. They stuff you so much with so much useless information, you feel full. And I actually really love that there are people that argue that whether or not Bradbury's right about what he thinks his book is about. <laughs> I love it. You get it, get the word right from the mouth. I guess they uh, they weren't into reading. <laughs> well, maybe because there are many articles and interviews and stuff with him prior that they say contradict what he says in two thousand seven. So interesting. You know, maybe maybe it's a six of one, half of another, <laughs> half dozen of another kind of thing. I don't know. Well, and, and you know what? We all change our minds about our own thoughts as we age anyway. So Yeah, very, very true. But I could definitely see him being anti-television. He was not, a, for a, a, a writer who wrote so much in the way of science fiction and science fantasy, he was not a fan of technology in general. He was not a big fan of, like, the internet. I could see him not being a fan of television. I mean, he was hammering things out on an old typewriter, not a word processor, not a computer, hmm. um, you know, up, up until the day he died. So I could I could see that. So it's almost as if he used the uh, format of uh, sci-fi to combat the things that he didn't like about the future. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, maybe. As I, we talked about last time, I watched this film the first time, and I'm pretty sure I read the book, but it was in high school, so we're talking well over 30 years ago. No, for the for this show, I had to at least uh, kind of do a, a rough summary kind of search on what the book covered. Um, Dig up a Cliff Notes sort of thing? Yeah, kind of a Cliff Notes sort of thing, because I want to... And, and, I'll just introduce that there are two versions of this in movie form. While this show is about the 1966 version, I did take it upon myself to watch the 2018 one as well. And since I hadn't read the book and I'm doing the Cliff Notes version, I actually found myself going, okay, this was in both, so I'm going to assume both of those things were also in the book if they were that important. But then some brought up other things, and I started looking uh, for information. Like uh, the second film, the 2018 one, mentioned something called an omnis or some or omnius or something like that. Omnis, yeah. omnis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to research to see if that was a thing. <laughs> so apparently, it was a thing in the book, if I understand that correctly, but not what was presented in the film. Gotcha. Now, I wish I could sit here and tell you I remember uh, the differences or what happened in the book compared to the film, but it's just been too long ago. It has inspired me to reread the book or read it for the first time, whichever it turns out it it, it, it to be. Uh, I do have it coming to me from the library because I, I, as much as I have some Ray Bradbury stuff upstairs, Fahrenheit 451 isn't among them. Uh, oddly enough, I have a copy and have never read it, and I don't ah. actually know how I got a copy. <laughs> I didn't. Is that play where it. mine went? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyway, no, I, I, it has me intrigued too. And it, this was interesting in the way that I chose to approach this stuff because I actually watched both back to back in a single sitting. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, because. As we talk about the 1966 movie, which is what we will do, um, I did. I was fascinated by it, but I'll just go ahead and say a little bored by <laughs> by it too. It, it's one of those. Um, the approach was artistic for artistic sake a lot of the time. Mm, yeah, I can see that. So. And, and I mean, being 1966, as we want to do the comparisons related to how much did they get right, uh, they did get some stuff right. Um, but the look and the feel is very 66. 
Yes. And that's something I think is interesting of films, almost really films of, not all films, many films of any period, is that when they predict the future, it always still looks very much like the era in which it's it's filmed. Uh, maybe that is all films. I'm, I was actually trying to like pull some aside, but now I'm thinking I'm like, no, that's still that's just '70s or that's just '80s. Uh, yeah, the, despite the fact that this is filmed in the '60s, and they're saying that this is sometime post 2020, it's still the '60s. And I've seen many films from the '80s set into the 2020s, and it still looks the '80s. And I was even thinking like. Oh, I was thinking at first, oh, well, the one that maybe really goes out and it makes itself try to look futuristic is something like Logan's Run. And I'm thinking, no, no, that was the 70s. <laughs> that was very 70s. I, I, I'm going to say right here on this show, right this moment, that we will see in the future at some point, the best analogy would be steampunk. Um, we... Steampunk rises a, as a, a merger of turn of the century 1900 to 1900 and then fusing that with technology that you would see now. Mm -hmm. I could imagine another, say, 50 years from now, um, whatever the equivalent technology is for then being thought of in a retro 60s kind of way. I mean, you're almost kind of getting a, a sense of that even with a, a not, I know I always like to bring up Star Trek, but Strange New Worlds. Um, yep. They have managed in their retconning to give you the look at, of that 60s vibe um, from, from the original series while still updating it to something that would be obviously very more futuristic. I see that being a trend that we'll see over and over and over again. Take your current stuff and fuse it with something retro. And I yeah. think the 60s will very much be the, one of those. Oh, no, absolutely. I think we've seen it in, in some small bits mm -hmm. in, uh, already. Uh, when you think uh, it was about oh, 10, 15 years ago where suddenly it was uh, the in thing to do was to have your, your kitchen table to be that like red with the silver, you know, like it was in a the diner um, style. The diner style and everything. It was all very 50s. 50s yeah. Uh-huh. Red and chrome. So, yeah. So I, I could definitely see that kind of stuff coming around. And you that's how you can argue that these futures could be, you know, a decent prediction. Because, yes, what's popular once becomes popular again. Yes. Uh, I did check out the uh, 2018 version as well. Uh by your recommendation mm -hmm. to, to, and it was an interesting watch and I don't want to get too far into that. No. Maybe towards the end, we can discuss it a little bit more so we can try to stay on topic with the, uh, the 66. Mm -hmm. um, Cause this uh, was a first time watch for you. It was. Yes. I'll admit uh, when, when I say bored, I, I wasn't bored. I actually was entertained by the film, uh, but I mean, it has that long drawn art house kind of feel to it. Deliveries of dialogue are kind of bland and flat at times, um, and and despite and this is just budget and all that. I get all that, but uh, for for a world that they're trying to build and suggest, there's nobody in it. <laughs> <laughs> They go all over the place, uh, walking, see, they were on that monorail, they're doing things. You're lucky if there's any, at any time, maybe 10 people total on screen. They, you could be in the middle of the city center and there aren't anybody, there, nobody's on the street, nobody's doing anything. So it has this very sterile, almost play-like feel to it. Well, and I wonder, whether it was intentional or not, because of the, the universe that this film sort of uh, portrays and the idea of everyone obviously being a little intellectually stunted because mm -hmm. you know, things like books and, and, and all that stuff is outlawed or whatever, everyone's sort of placated by television and medication. 
is there a sharp decline in population? That's fair. I'm going to draw from some of the little research that I did for the book, and it does fit into the 2018 as well. It, there is an event of some kind, the 2018, and I think the book mentions a, a war. The, the 66 movie didn't really seem to touch on what led us to this moment where uh, um, the theme that kept running through it that they mentioned over and over again, too, is... Um, as Montag is awakening to other possibilities, is even the concept that firefighters used to actually put fires out. Mm -hmm. We don't know when all that changed. Uh, but one of the things that I really want to research, I want to read it the book because none of them have ever mention anything. How do they know how to read? Yes, that was a question <laughs> I had too, especially when... Montauk, who is a fireman, who's always been a fireman, who's grown up in this society, whatever happened ha had to have happened several generations ago sure. for, for people to have forgotten that firemen were not always book burners. And, and I think we're supposed to buy into the whole um, the drug component of this, too. They're, they're actually... Yes. It's possible that it might not even be as long as we might think it is. It could be a, a total repression of the, the thoughts and memories, depending on how you take what you're watching. Yeah, 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 that, very good point. But, uh, but yes, I, I did question, he picks up a book and actually starts reading, yeah. and he doesn't read it, he doesn't read it, you know, like, quickly or, or fluently. He reads it at maybe, like, a, you know, fifth grade level sort of thing yes. picking up a picking up your first like adult kind of novel and yeah, you're trying, trying to, to get over the big words. The words that you are a little longer than the basics yes yeah exactly but it's like yes how how do you know how to read if you don't read i i would like to read a book too to try to see if bradbury can explain how a society can function without um manuals without instructions, without any written word. Now, I mean, we get sort of a hint of it in the 66 when he picks up his uh, his magazine and it's all it just pictures. Yeah, his, his daily newspaper is just a series of images and cartoons. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I was actually thoroughly impressed by that element in there. Like... Even when they were when we're in the precinct and, and um, the chief's going through some of the records and any folder he opens up is just a series of pictures. It, there's mm -hmm. no writing whatsoever. So I actually did kind of rather love the commitment to the written word is gone. We're using symbols. We're using pictures. We're using imagery, cartooning, that kind of stuff but we have dialed it back to cave painting, basically. Right. This is modern yeah. cave painting. <laughs> and I suppose the only way you learn anything is by someone telling you mm -hmm. how to do it. Which and we even you... get that scene with uh, the training class that they're having, and Montauk even has to deliver that. So Right, yep. You know, the commitment uh, extends even to the opening credits of the film. Yes. There is no written text at the beginning of the film. It is spoken what this film is, who it stars by, who it's directed by. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I, I had almost forgotten that point because I, I wanted to talk about it and, and, and it kind of left my head that, like, wait, wait, why are the credits being read to me? There's nothing on the screen. <laughs> we're just, we're, you're just telling me who made this film and who's starring in it and that's interesting but I'm like is that how this is going and I didn't even it's only till you just said something now I'm like oh <laughs> crap that's, that's the total point of that <laughs> yeah it took me a split second when I was watching it my wife and I were both watching and that happened and we're just like look like oh that's odd and then it just then it it just hit me as the film was starting like oh 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 there's no words. There's no books. There's no no writing. Uh, but yeah, I got so obsessed in the content of the film, and and that's why I don't want to. I don't want to rag on it too much. It, yeah, it ha has its usual foibles of a '60s kind of uh, 
film, especially one that's trying to have a very artistic kind of framework and all that. But it was, I was drawn in. I was enthralled by what what this story was trying to tell me. And I got so obsessed with it, I forgot that the credits were read to me. I, I think this film, some of the aesthetic in the film must come through just the production and the people behind it. You've got a French director who mm. barely speaks English. Yeah. Directing an English language film starring a German... Yeah. who speaks English, but with a very thick accent. You get the feeling that it's it's maybe only a... It's not a second language, it's maybe a, a half language. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and his German comes through. <laughs> oh, yeah, In absolutely. his whole body language. And, 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 Which I, I also kind of like, because I don't think it was... I, I don't know. I, this is one of those things that's 1966. I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but actually he wasn't the first person uh, that they uh, originally had uh, slated for the role. I think mm. uh, Terrence Stamp was going to uh, star, and he uh, he bowed out. Oh, okay. uh, I, I read he bowed out because he, he didn't want to be uh, overshadowed by Julie Christie's dual role. <laughs> so <laughs> that's... It, it, it's re- I read it on the internet, so take that as you will. <laughs> well, then it must but be having, true. <laughs> ha- having Oscar Werner and being with with his German accent, it does ha- have that sort of feel of, and you hate to do it because you hate to stereotype because he's German, but considering the, the subject matter and everything, there is that Nazi element. <laughs> and, and given where he's supposed to start... That might be part of the vibe that they were going for. The problem is, is because of the the delivery the rest of the way, even when he's having a more emotional response and, and, and is becoming awakened to the possibility of reading and what is being left out of their society at the moment. None of it floods through on the screen. <laughs> it still comes off pretty flat and dry. Well, and it, to me, it comes sudden. That is something I think this film lacks, is we really, we see him being, he's a fireman. He's fireman true and true. He believes this, this is how it should go. He's his his, uh, about his, his promotion. His, he's excited about his promotion. His chief is like almost goading him mm-hmm. into reading. And he's like, no, I'm not interested. This is not my thing. And then a few scenes later, he's stealing a book and going home and reading it. And like, where did this come from? Right. It really comes out of nowhere. You do get the impression that he's a little annoyed with uh, what the, the the society has kind of done to his wife. She's just mm-hmm. glued to the television and, and popping pills. And he's kind of losing interest in her because she's not interesting yeah, at she's all. A, she's a zombie in the house. Yeah. Um, so you can definitely see where he's getting a little annoyed with that, but that would seem to be more like a, well, let's turn off the TV tonight and let's talk. Not, I'm going to steal contraband <laughs> and bring it into the house. <laughs> yeah, no, that that was quite the leap. And, and since you touched on that, it's actually a thing that I want to visit the book about, too, is um, in, in this movie, there's a huge misogyny <laughs> element to this because they they've introduced that p that there are pills that are being taken but it's kind of clear that only the women are taking the pills yeah you never see a man uh with any do you yeah and and montag's kind of disgust uh over the pills uh, and the fact that uh, at one point linda even uh ods um, and she has to be corrected, and I love to look, know more about what that was. That scene was supposed to actually be like what the 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 ambulance <laughs> attendants did with the whole blood transfusion thing, uh, and, and the fact that she was more amorous <laughs> afterward. I'm like, <laughs> there's a part missing, and now I gotta go read because. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Ray, maybe Ray Bradbury really loves this film because it's there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of 
bat crap crazy in, <laughs> in it that it just begs you to go and read the text so you can actually know what the hell just happened on the screen. Yes, yes. I mentioned uh, Julie Christie playing the, the dual roles. I'll admit, it took a few moments for my brain to click that it was two different, or it was the same woman playing the two different characters. Oh, really? Yeah, it did. It actually took me a minute. It just, in like, I knew it. I mean, you read the credits, you, you you know it's it's her. But in my, sort of in the back of my head, I'm watching the film, and it, you had to keep, like, reminding myself, oh, yeah, that's the same actress. Uh, it was an interesting choice. And, again, that was something originally there were two different actresses, or the, the, the film was meant to have two different actresses. And at some point, someone in production or or the director Truffaut said no let's have the same actress and we'll have her play in two sides of the same coin and I think it ends up working pretty well I actually like the way that works I I did like the that element and I I picked up on that right away in fact I kind of picked up on that before he even got home (laughs) like when he meets uh Clarice Mm -hmm. on the train and they're walking, and he, he flat out mentions his wife at some point. Um, while I didn't know it was going to be the same actress, I'm like, this is going to be him seeing two different sides of a woman. I, I, I just, it, I don't know why it just smacked me in the face that that's what's going to happen. Especially given how outgoing and uh, gregarious that Clarice was on the train. I mean, it, it was it was jolting to Montauk to have this woman talking to him like mm-hmm. this, and it was something he hasn't had experience with. So when we get home and we meet Linda, and she is practically comatose, um, I'm like, and, and then I recognize that it's the same actress. I'm like, I like what you did there. That's pretty cool. <laughs> You know, and that's another thing where I feel like something's missing with the Montauk character is Clarice seems like she's targeted him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which makes me think that she's been watching him or her group has been watching him as, a, as saying, ah, oh, there's something about that one. He's questioning. He's looking. We need to try to get him on our side. But we don't see any of that. Right. And again, which begs you to go read if that was actually a component to the story. Yeah, I I wish there was something they could have done in the film to give us some indication that he was already on that trail or on that path, I mm-hmm. should say. Uh, he already had a, a, a book or two stashed away or, or some thing that he shouldn't. Right. Um, or to even even to have a, a line to his wife or, or to someone about uh, make him the one like, well, aren't you ever curious? You know, anything like that. And they just don't. It's he's following the party line until he's not. Right. And they do all sorts of interesting elements with, um, well, in this particular case, Clarice and Montauk, because even when you get. When you get to, there's a part that I'm confused by at the end, and I know there's supposed to be some sort of imagery and artistry in there, but I'm confused. They went out of their way that when Montauk is taken into the the group that, uh, the essentially the books. The book people. The book mm-hmm. people, because that's what they're doing. They're memorizing the books, and each one is a book, and I, I, I actually kind of dug that element to... Uh, um, it's interesting seeing this now. There was a Denzel Washington movie probably a decade ago, Book of Eli, and that was the character's role is he was basically memorizing a book to take. And it was the Bible in this case. But, um, but yeah, so I love that element. But when we get to the end and Montauk's taken in, He's introduced to a number of people. Um, Clarice is there, but did you notice that they had them purposely missing each other 
more than a few times before yeah. we get to the final end where they're kind of side by side. Yeah, yeah, I, I did notice that. And, and, but I don't know what that was for or what that meant. It, it, that's what I'm saying. It, it is, Truffaut has a, a very... He, he's an artist trying to sculpt something, but there's some parts missing. And, and I want those parts back. <laughs> Speaking of things that were a little confusing in the in the film did you pick up on and i noticed this right away i even noticed it before they were done uh it was the opening scene where um where montag is going to somebody's home who has contraband and all that and he gets suited up to burn the books and if you pay close attention it was actually shot in reverse. Mm. So him putting on the clothes, the, 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 the gloves, getting handed the thing, it, it, they even might have missed it or just kind of blew it off as possible. Um, in doing a reverse uh, of, of the whole thing, you can even see the fire go back into the flamethrower after when, he's handed, when it's handed to him. Oh, I didn't notice that at all. And... and I want to know if there's more to that too. So, so basically, you're seeing him get dressed, but he actually isn't. He's taken it all off, and they just ran it backward. Um, Interesting. And they do it, it. It's a straight cut from the time he's handed the flame tr- thrower all the way back to him pulling on the gear and getting the gloves and all that. So they did that, but then when he's done. It's the same thing, only run forward. Hmm. And I want to know if there was a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I, I'll admit it. I, I didn't catch it, and I. Even if you don't want to watch the whole movie, I just go back and watch that sequence. <laughs> it, it's a, almost unnerving. Cause, <laughs> cause it's good enough that you didn't notice it. But it's off enough that it hit me in the head as like this is supposed to mean something. There's more to yeah. this than than yeah. That. You want to know you want to know if it meant something or was there just a mistake in a cut and they just said, well, just reverse this footage and we'll use it. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, they would have had to uh, from the way that this is shot. It would have they would have had to have gotten to the burning part so that he could do the. T- taking the gear off thing and handing that over. So did they shoot the the getting dressed part and just decide they didn't like it, so they ran the getting unsuited backward? Or <laughs> is it, like I said, this isn't going to be the, one of those things in the back of my head just eating my brain up as I go senile someday. <laughs> Maybe part of the reason that I can get enthralled in something that, for me, sat a little bland is because I want all the parts that are missing. (laughs) Well, the parts that are there, (laughs) uh, there are many that are just kind of Mm jaw-dropping, just amazing little bits of cinema. Uh, The home that is effectively the library... Mm -hmm. You know, it's a home stacked with books. Yes. And actually the entire scene with his chief, uh, Beatty, and him talking upstairs in, you know, in, in the attic, looking at all these books, that's a great scene. It is. It's an amazing scene. Uh, with Beatty describing effectively why they're in the society they are now. Picking up authors that he knows, like, oh, the, the so-and-sos didn't like him, so into the flames it went. And then, of course, you couldn't have these because that offended these people and all philosophers. Everyone says they're right and everyone else's is wrong. <laughs> and, and, and as he's going through that, while at your heart you know everything he's saying is wrong, mm-hmm. but he makes a very compelling argument for why they are where they're at Uh, like it's it's kind of a thanos moment isn't it it kind (laughs) of is like you've done the wrong thing we know you've done the wrong thing but you are on to something as to why you did the wrong yeah you're you're making compelling arguments yes and 
it was unnerving me how much I was like, ooh, you're not necessarily wrong. (laughs) (laughs) And then that scene is followed by them trying to get the woman to leave. They've got the pile of books on the floor. They've they've soaked it with kerosene and are trying to get her to leave and she won't leave. In fact, she lights a match mm-hmm. and and bur- burns herself alive along with all her books. This is a moment in the film too where I'm a little mystified at this world because the firefighter, the, the firemen, they're not firefighters, um, but the firemen, they're actually kind of taken aback at the fact mm-hmm. that there is a woman dying in front of them. Which makes me wonder, is, you would think if people are fighting for, for having the books that they're hiding, this has not come up? I, I, I mean, I, I, and it is a question I have back to a movie that can't answer that question. But seriously, in this world, does that not come up more often? Maybe not so much that an, ent- an entire station will have been uh, experienced it before. Yeah. Uh, maybe one or two. Maybe the older ones, maybe the chief has seen something like it before. Right. Which is why he seems to be the only one that really keeps his cool and pulls people out, yeah. you know, while it's happening. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, but it is a fascinating kind of element to it. And I, it's one of those, I don't know if it was intentional or not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's such interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm really looking forward to, as you said a couple of times, I'm really looking forward to actually reading the book. <laughs> I may literally Again. have to go pull it off the shelf and start. <laughs> <laughs> Dana, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the technology uh, that they mention and or or is shown in the film? Yeah, because uh, actually I was impressed right out of the gate by their widescreen, flat screen TV. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, that is nailed like, it. N- I, I, nailed it at a thousand percent. And the concept that similar shaped screens maybe throughout your home yes in 66 that would have been unthinkable (laughs) right you're lucky if you could afford one and it was gonna be little and it was gonna be heavy (laughs) yeah you know this is this is on a wall and there's even a uh a comment that uh with his promotion he'll get more pay and his wife of course you know a he's saying oh maybe we can get a bigger house yeah or, and move to a nicer neighborhood. And she's like, oh, I was thinking we could get another wall screen. Yeah. And then uh, when she when he mentions that to the chief, he's like, oh, you've only got one wall converted in your house? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But yeah, no, uh, they couldn't have hit that any closer if they had tra- if they had actually traveled forward in time. No, no, it, that, that was really, really... <laughs> Impressive. As soon as you see it, you're like, "Whoa! Wait a minute!" <laughs> well, yeah, uh, 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 and the freeze. Not, I- not even just. Not even like. And I think you, you mentioned it. it's not even that they're flat screen. That's widescreen. Yes. No. It, 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 it's the aspect ratio we use now. Yeah. <laughs> like that's that was insane. I wasn't expecting that. And the reason I think I wasn't expecting that is, and why it hit me so hard. It is watching them ride around on the open air fire truck. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nobody secured anything. <laughs> They're all just standing there. Taking a turn, everyone hang on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm like So yeah, by the time we get to a widescreen television the size of your wall, <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what worlds are you guys living in? It's practically a Studebaker <laughs> riding around. I like that to uh, justify the fact that firemen start fires in this universe. All the homes and buildings are quote unquote fireproof. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I did kind of dig that. The fact that we even had to mention that uh, Claire East lives in a house that's not been rendered fireproof <laughs> yeah and montag's like well it should be turned it should be torn down and a new one built because <laughs> this is a thing that's happening 
<laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. And the notion that, yes, you have to do that because there's a good chance we're coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, the technology, although we had a flat screen TVs, we still were getting our television through the air. So we had antennas yeah, on all the chimneys and the ceiling. <laughs> But that turned into sort of a plot point that, oh, we always knew there was something strange about them. Why? Well, look, look around and you look around and over there, over there, over there, fire, there's an antenna. There's a TV antenna. There's a TV antenna. Now look at their roof. There is no TV antenna. <laughs> you know what? Now, now that you me mentioned the antennas, too, since during the opening sequence, the credits are read to you. That is what they are showing you is antennas. Yes. A and this is where we can probably suggest that maybe they were on to Ray Bradbury's last comments about the film, mm -hmm. because I think they did hit that. Yeah, no, I think so. Uh, we do see sort of like a ring doorbell sort of thing. Yes. Montag comes to the door and his wife, he's got his hands full or something like that, or there's something wrong with the door and it didn't open for him. So she has to look on a monitor to see who it is. <laughs> yep. No, no, that was very cool. Uh, outside of that, then the technology gets a little crazier, like the anti-gravity fire poles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, which wasn't even entirely obvious how, <laughs> what, what was happening. <laughs> Obviously, and, and that 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 in and of itself was part of why the earlier sequence with the reverse footage, because that's the only way that you could do what they were doing was uh, he slid down the pole and they reversed the footage. So right, I'm like, is this going to be a trend in this film? But the fact that these poles will slide you up to the second floor, but apparently have a mind of their own or can tell when you're no longer got your mind on the job because that won't work right yeah they, <laughs> the comment about what's with the pole <laughs> yeah what's with you in the pole montag <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> starts taking the stairs i can't think of much of else technologically that that was pretty much what we got to see we did see some sort of jet packs oh yeah i forgot oh yeah <laughs> All that time with the firefighters, and then all of a sudden we're we're hunting men with, with jetpacks. It's also the first time you see guns. Yeah, yeah. I will. It's unfortunate the jetpacks are very poorly rendered. They are. <laughs> the effect is not very good. But to their credit, such a jetpack to that kind of degree exists. It's a real yeah. thing. Yeah, no, that's they're, they're not common. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not everybody has it. I don't think you're going to find it in your local uh, uh, police uh, or fireman. Uh. <laughs> right, but the, there are ones uh, that would probably come similar looking to that. So yeah, so uh, that was a minor one, but that's not bad. Yeah, but you're right. Uh, outside of that, the technology is all grounded pretty well in the 60s do we even see any other motor cars outside of the fire truck not that i can recall i can't recall i any. can't even remember seeing one parked no me, me me neither that's weird yeah but yeah in which case it makes the uh fire truck stand out all the more because they didn't seem to have any trouble getting anywhere at all ever <laughs> yeah no, never any traffic or anything no Maybe everyone took that uh, suspended monorail. Now, I, I, I'm going to throw it out there, not technologically. I'm only going to touch on that a little. But the th one thing, unfortunately, that I, is fairly close it, it is a a political point these days. While we're not, well, we're not aggressively going out and burning books. There is a wave of dissent against certain literature because it teaches you something that somebody doesn't agree with so the suppression of that given the entire suppression of it in this film a little too close to home <laughs> yeah yeah just a, a a little bit and again you could see where the world we live in now could turn into the world they live in in this film because like it's described by Beatty in the attic. You know, it's it's not one side or another side. 
it's pretty much both sides throwing one book or another into the flame. Right. Yeah, no, uh, so it, it, I hope we're not going to make this more real than it is, but it's we're sitting in a very touchy spot uh, where it could go that way if things went horribly, horribly wrong. And then I find it funny on the flip side, while in, in Fahrenheit 451, they're helping to control their population with drug use, uh, so the government drugging you, that's an actual ongoing conspiracy theory that lives in our world perpetually that the government is trying to control us right down to fluoride in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Which has raised its head rather forcefully here recently. And, and, and then the bugs in your vaccines. Oh, did I lose you? No. Ah, there you are. Ah. You froze up for a sec. Oh, and that was just the... The lit. fluoride... Ma- Ah, it's the government. It's the government. They they're on to us. That's right, folks. Uh, they, while recording, they uh, they were listening in and they had to halt us temporarily. But we have succumbed. Yes. We've, we've overcome. Yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> it's the drugs in the water. I can't speak. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the 2018 before we go any further? Yeah, and, and let's just touch on it, just based on um, how if how much it kind of did parallel the, the the 66 one versus where they chose to go in different directions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was certainly a much flashier version. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, their future, again, I, I think, I feel like their future wasn't so much a future. It was more of an alternate now. Could be. Um, again, in that one, and I do know that they reference, they reference the Second Civil War. Again, kind of a touchy subject these days. Uh, yes. But uh, um, they reference that. So it's kind of it's kind of hard to tell when that might have happened. So I still right. kind of get the feel. This could have been our world. And they actually talk about the, the drug use more specifically around suppression. Uh, around the idea that uh, as the Montauk in the 2018 version progresses, um, everything comes to him in flashes and dreams and, and the the drops that they take uh, daily are likely the thing that is causing him not to have full retention of what he might have known once upon a time. Yeah, the, the less he takes his drops, the more he starts remembering. Yep. And I, I think that was, again, need to read the book to know which way went which way. But you could see I both the 66 and the 18, maybe they're no, both wrong to a degree, but they are interesting takes on the same idea. Yeah. I think the 2018 was really interesting actually bringing up the idea that there was a second civil war. And to end that civil war, they decided let's just get rid of everything yeah. that caused that silver civil war. Yes. Just and erased that's, all history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it becomes a lot of alternative history. Oh, here's Ben Franklin who invented, who came up with the idea of the firemen to go out and burn all these books. <laughs> right. Which I thought was an interesting way to take a turn on actual history. Yes. Just bend it just the right way. <laughs> mm-hmm. he, he did invent firefighting. <laughs> But not fire starting. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that that was uh, interesting. And then this one did, and it's why I brought up the ominous. But I, I did kind of rather enjoy their take on in, instead. It, it was weird. They kind of did it dual. Um, this one also had people who were memorizing entire books. But then they were taking it to a new level where they were encoding in genetics to store all of it forever, always. Mm -hmm. And and I thought that was an interesting thing. That's why now I want to read the book and find out if there was some element like that. I like the idea that they, this society, the people that were trying to save the books, knew that, you know, they could uh, memorize the books and try to pass it along, but there's flaws in that mm-hmm. 
and and there's going to be reinterpretations and there's going to be things that are forgotten or accidents will happen i mean they lost grapes of wrath in 2018 uh in in the fire right um and so the idea that all our knowledge all the books either they could they could encode into dna and inject it into a bird and then the idea is to replicate it and inject it into as many animals as they could. So they can knowing, pass it genetically for always. Yes, exactly. So hopefully someday someone, society will shift, will turn. They can recover all of history. Yeah, exactly. And the society could then discover, oh, wait, look what's encoded in here and all these, all this all these novels, all this literature will be saved. I, I, that's, I mean, that's big thought, long game, but it's really interesting. No, it is very cool. Um, and I don't know that the 2018 thing, but I want to touch on something that they did that didn't make sense in the 66. They tried, uh, where they mentioned those that become the books, they read them, memorize them and all of that. After they've done so, they destroy the book. Right, because that way they're not breaking the law. But that's kind of not how it was explained in the 66. They said it's so what was actually said is so they can't take it from us. Mm. Uh, Like, couldn't you hang on to the book until they actually do take it from you? (laughs) Yeah, but if they take it from you, then they're probably going to take you and take you to some re-education center or something and throw you up with a bunch fill you up with a bunch of drugs and make you forget that that that's probably a fair assessment i just, <laughs> it, it confused me well uh do you want to go to some social media we can let's do it we only just have the one we won't it won't take long we only got one comment over on our discord channel steph from film gazers uh talking about the 1966 version yeah she says, this is one that is steeped in nostalgia for me. I read the book during my tween years, and it really kickstarted my interest into more sci-fi and dystopian fiction. Naturally, I saw the movie after, and it too helped kickstart my love of the 60s and 70s sci- sci-fi style films. I haven't watched it in a very long time, and she's looking forward to hearing what we think of it. Cool. So, thank you very much, Steph. Yeah, I like the idea that this one kind of kickstarted a little something in a, in a in a young woman into seeking out more uh films like this so i'm assuming she's dug up and looked into things like soylent green and mm. omega man and all the other fun stuff from the 70s yeah all the classic uh, sci-fi yes i i recommend it i said if you like the 60s and 70s kind of kitsch you know dystopian future i recommended uh the 10th victim to her which is sort of a um, okay a U.S. Italian uh, co-production, I think. I think it was a U.S. I, it was in. It's in English, but it's obviously <laughs> Italian. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, uh, the spaghetti westerns of uh, apocalypses. Is, is. It's it's a pre-Running Man. I'm surprised I didn't mention it when we covered Running Man not that long ago. Oh, nice. But it's it's very 60s. But it's the same idea that it's effectively a game show, and peop, there's a hunter and then and, and a and a runner, and one tries to kill the other and to see who can win. And you, know, if you get ten, your tenth victim, and you get rewarded, and you get to retire. And what was the name of the film again? The tenth victim. The tenth victim. I might have to check that one out. I think you should check that one out. It's a nineteen. 19- 60 i don't remember the year i think it's 1960s um but yeah i i strongly recommend that no, film. very cool especially if you like this era of films that are like this is the future kind of thing yeah i kind of getting into a, a more of a 60s sci-fi vibe there, there, there's something just kind of cool about it it's wrong and it's ugly sometimes but it's cool <laughs> The 60s and then going into the 70s, it's either the future is bright or the future is bleak and there is never anything in between. Yeah, no, there's just not. (laughs) Yeah. Well, nobody wants to go to the film that see that your life is exactly like it is 200 (laughs) years from now. No one wants to know that. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's, it's, it's better just... 
it either make it really happy or just make me have to fight clans of mutants. Right, exactly. <laughs> There's. A, I just want it to be more interesting than what is now. <laughs> yes. So what did the critics have to say in 1966? Well, th- thanks to Wikipedia and the New York Times, I actually was able to get stuff from um, the 60s. So that's good. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I've got here for, only two, though. <laughs> <laughs> so the first is from Time Magazine, couldn't find a writer. Um, but it's a, uh, I love this part. Uh, it describes the film as a weirdly gay little picture that assails both with both horror and humor all forms of tyranny over the mind of a man. It strongly supports the widely held s- Suspicion that Julie Christie cannot actually act. Aww. <laughs> I knew you weren't going to like that part. Though she plays two women of diametrically divergent dispositions, loving the D's there, uh, <laughs> they seem in her portrayal to differ only in their hairdos. Oh, I disagree. I kind of disagree with that as well, but I knew that was really going to dig on you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely disagree with that. No, I, I mean, it was clearly... T- I mean, I think she did a great job uh, separating the differences between those. If, you, if there was only any critique, it's all done from a very uh, stage-like performance. It's almost a little too far in both directions. At mm. times, mm. at least for me, the way that the way that Montauk was played flat throughout, um, Clarice was very moving, very very over the top, lots of gestures in your face, kind of stretching the line of what is uh, considered appropriate in society when it comes to communication. And Linda, she just wants to watch TV. And well, she she, she, she could have been act. in. She's gonna be. She could be an actress. She could yes. be only as long as the TV is talking to that Linda and not any Linda. <laughs> yeah, we didn't talk about the uh, quote unquote television show, the soap opera, yeah. or whatever it was. That was an interesting. Uh, that that was very. F- <laughs> Sorry, folks, but th- to me, that was very French. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was very much so, <laughs> but. Then going to the other side of things, New York Times, Bosley Crowther, I think uh, is how you say that. He says, um, a pretentious and pedantic production based on an idea that called for slashing satire of a sort beyond Truffaut's grasp and with language he couldn't fashion into lively and witty dialogue. The consequence is a dull picture dully fashioned and dully played, which is rendered all the more sullen by the dazzling color in which it is photographed. So, not a fan. No, not at all. I can see his point and maybe agree to a small amount of a lot of what he said early in his review. Mm. But... I think a lot, at least I took, a lot of what he was complaining about, I took as being intentional. But I could be, I could just as easily be mistaken. Again, I think right after either of us finish reading, uh, the pretentious and pedantic part may literally come from the author of the actual book. (laughs) (laughs) I, I mean that whole uh, that whole notion. Uh, this is why I could buy into the TV thing that this was supposed to be more focused about TVs making you stupid. Um, he didn't see it for anything more than that. So that pretentious notion that I know better than everybody <laughs> that I think that might come through the book, the movie, no matter how you tell this story. Mm-hmm. So he's on to something. It's just it's the point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's maybe uh, it was too close, to, yeah. <laughs> too close to this reviewer's face to. Uh, well, that and then I get I don't get the impression uh, he's a fan of 
French film, so <laughs> some of that artistic flair is is lost on this pro particular critic. And given the '60s and who might have been writing for New York Times at the time, yep, probably not the artistic type. <laughs> right, and we can say what we like because chances are this person is no longer with yeah, us. <laughs> a, 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 a pretty much guaranteed, yes. <laughs> yes. I didn't bother to look, but it did look good. So, <laughs> I'm still glad we watched this one, even though I think it's probably going to be the be a standout amongst the films we watch in this series, as far as just the type of film. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, um, it was really neat revisiting. It, it now that I've watched it again after you know 30 years or something. Mm-hmm. It won't be another 30 years before I decide to give this another viewing, I, especially after I read the book. Right. I feel like I'm going to read the book and then I go, okay, now I want to re- want to rewatch that movie. And, and since I haven't delved into any of this until just now, the explanation of Fahrenheit 451 as the title is just kind of awesome. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, oh, it's funny. I read, uh, again, I read a couple... Um, a couple articles and some quotes from uh, from Bradbury that he asked somebody about that, and it was someone effectively just sort of throwing out a number. Oh, really? And actually, the number may have been like that's how hot a book would have to get before it just combusts, yeah. before itself combusts. Yeah. If you raise the temperature or whatever, it's not necessarily you know. So yeah, Ray Bradbury didn't actually bother to go and like double check that. It just it <laughs> sounded good, and so he went with it. <laughs> yeah, and I I like it. So there are people like, well, maybe that's you know, if you just put a book in a hot room and it gets to four hundred fifty one degrees, it'll burst in the flames. Yeah, sounds good to me. I believe it. Can't <laughs> test it, but I believe it. Yeah, no, I mean I, I well actually you can. But <laughs> oh yeah, I suppose you could. I could put a book in my oven, couldn't I? <laughs> You, yeah, you could. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you could. Um, but yeah, no. I, it, but it, it sits in that like cute little spot where sounds right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't really say. So you could tell me that all day long. But I did like that. That was the meaning for, mm-hmm. for for why the book was called what it was called, and the fact that that is actually the number for. For the uh, the precinct that we're dealing with, yeah, they wear it like a badge. Yeah, they, yeah, it's literally on. Yeah. Uh, and and just, uh, just the one thought there, though, uh, since you mentioned it as the badge, I love the the the, uh, the look of the black, the all black uniform made it into mm-hmm. both films. Yeah, yeah. So I thought I just thought that was a cute little. No, I don't know if it was a not one was nodding to the other, or if in the book they actually say what they look like. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, it, it makes sense to me though, because I'm thinking, well, you'd wear it all black because it wouldn't show the soot, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it made perfect sense. But the also the no, the the fact that they also look kind of like a Nazi uniform, <laughs> very militaristic. Yeah, very militaristic. Uh, so it. It hit all the right tones, so I imagine it actually is the in the book, and then I like that it got carried through over yeah. decades. Um, and speaking of, uh, speaking of you know, the, the burning books, and talking about a little bit of uh, the filming of this, the photography mm-hmm. and the filming of the books burning are all. If it weren't for the fact that it's a burning book, yeah. that would be a wonderful screensaver because it is beautiful. Yes. As each page individually burns away, and it's even described by I think Beatty, talking about that they, they look like um, uh, black tulips or something, or, or black flowers or yeah, flower they, petals yeah, as like as they blooming. burn. Yeah, uh, and it's like, huh, that is mesmerizing. But it's just bad that it's a book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that that's I think how you're supposed to feel. <laughs> Good. I, I I just I feel like you know I'm just gonna get reams of paper of blank paper and start <laughs> <laughs> throw, throw them in the fire and to watch them. <laughs> that's a way to go. <laughs> 
Well, then I, I think that's going to do it for Fahrenheit 451, a really interesting watch. If you've not seen this film, I, I would highly recommend checking it out. Yes. Uh, it is not going to be for everyone, but I still think it's a film that maybe everyone should watch at least once. Yeah, I, I feel like you need it. Mm-hmm, yeah. And I hope it inspires you, as it has Tom and I, to actually go and read the novel. <laughs> Really? Yeah, no, because they're just le- there's so much room for more information and you just kind of hope it's in the book. So mm-hmm. I'll be disappointed if we read the book and it doesn't <laughs> have any of it. <laughs> I'd be very surprised. I think that's one of the things I love about Ray Bradbury is he's very descriptive in his storytelling. I, so It's what I'm hoping for, but that, <laughs> there's just that little nag. <laughs> <laughs> My God, I read the whole book and it's still as bad as the rest of that. <laughs> well, for the next film we're going to cover, we're going to jump back into some more of, <laughs> I guess, um, more comfortable fare, perhaps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little less light, a little, a little, excuse me, a little less heavy. Um, or at least we'll hope so. Hopefully nothing in the world that starts leading toward whether or not people are collecting your body parts on a regular basis. <laughs> yes. So yeah, we're going to look at Repo Men from 2010. This film is set in the year 2025. So we're going to find out what it's going to be like one year from now. <laughs> yeah, that is going to do it again. Uh, my apologies to anybody who tried to access the website uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, hoping by now everything has been restored and is just business as usual. And we will be back in a couple weeks to discuss Repo Men. Thank you very much for listening. We will talk to you next time. Bye, everybody. See ya.